They don't want none. They getting scared. Anyway, <clears throat> skipped majorly ahead in the timeline as far as our review of American literature. There's a big reason I've done that. Now, Long Day's Journey Into Night is a play that is very, very close to my heart. I absolutely adore this play. There's something about the gradual decay and destruction of a family that just, it's, it's a spectacular and horrific thing to witness. Now, Long Day's Journey Into Night also is really interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, we're local in Brunswick, and I believe Eugene Emile, the writer, actually lived on St. Simon's Island for a while, which is kind of a nifty thing. I think there's like a museum down there for, for about him. But the reason that we're skipping ahead, if you've noticed the last couple of pieces that we've read, Chopin, Yellow Wallpaper, and now Long Day's Journey into Night, um, all of these pieces all have something in common. They all have something very poignant to say about social problems. Chopin and Yellow Wallpaper were both talking about the rights and the experiences of women from a feminist perspective. Now, I don't think we've really talked too terribly much about naturalism and realism, but this makes a lot of sense as we have distanced ourselves from the fantasy and the kind of gothic storytelling that was so common in the beginning part of the semester. Now it's as if Americans have begun to be hypersensitive to the world around them. Now, I don't know if I ever talked with you guys about this in the American Lit class, but this is a foundation of something that would eventually become what has been known as social justice warriorism. The uh, A lot of people view poetry and literature as something that's supposed to call attention to the problems of the age. <clears throat> We're supposed to look at injustice. We're supposed to look at societal issues, explore them, and look for ways to rectify them. For me, solutions almost should never be present in literature, though. Literature is about communicating the experience, Right? Creating more empathy so that we come to understand each other's pain more and more. And that's something that might come up in a test question because I really like that view of literature. Uh, that when literature starts to um, suggest solutions to problems, it has a tendency to become more politics and philosophy. But literature really should just call us to feel. And none of this is coming from a textbook. This is all my personal opinion on how literature operates and what it does. So for me, I'm not a big fan of when my literature is being prescriptive and trying to solve problems. I want it to communicate to me what the problems are and help me identify and commiserate with the people who are suffering under those circumstances. Now, Chopin and Yellow Wallpaper do that very well. We end up in the shoes of people who suffer under oppressive systems. Now, Long Day's Journey of Tonight brings us symbolical. In this case, it's not necessarily the societal structure that is being... Oh, man, it says my connection is unstable. Uh, did it cut me out? I guess I'll just soldier on. Um, so... What the problem is in Long Day's Journey and Tonight is much, much more complex, a little bit more on the side of philosophical, but it's saved by the fact that we never see any real solutions to this. Long Day's Journey and Tonight is a study of mental health issues, physical health issues, and addiction. Addiction being the most prominent. <clears throat> now, I've gotten into arguments with several other instructors over this play before because for me, the real banger, the real kick in the butt with this play, the thing that hurts the most is something that's hard to describe. And a lot of people disagree with me on this point. For me, what makes the experience of this play so painful and poignant is that I see the characters in the play still caring for each other. 
if you have a family that's stuck together in a room and they're all basically tearing each other apart out of just a gross badness that affects them all, if they are all basically just evil demon goblins just ripping into each other, it's a lot less tragic because there's no one there to identify with. But for me, every single player, every single character in this play <sighs> seems to legitimately care about the others. That's what makes this tragic and what makes it painful. And again, a lot of people have disagreed with me on this point because they think that this family is too far gone. A lot of other instructors feel that this family is completely and totally psychotic, completely and totally manipulative, and there's no actual love there at all. I, I am not sure that my claim is 100% defensible, but that's one of the big things that I've gotten in arguments with people with about this play. Now, let me introduce a few historical items to consider as we walk through this. <clears throat> one, Edmund. Edmund has consumption. Now, this play is remarkably timely in this regard because it, Edmund's consumption is a very aggressive, very debilitating disease. This disease gets in his lungs and it's incredibly difficult to overcome consumption, also known as tuberculosis. Now, you have to understand that at this point, for a lot of people, tuberculosis was practically a death sentence. Treating tuberculosis meant that you almost always had to remove them from their current circumstances and take them somewhere else to be treated. Uh, one of the things that was generally considered a good treatment for consumption was a change in climate. So if you are you know, in a humid area, they would want to take you up into the mountains. And the sanatoriums that they discuss within the play were usually hospitals that were built high up in the mountains and where there was a nice dry air, dry, cooler air. And you would stay there anywhere from six months to maybe even more than a year. And they would feed you really healthy food. And that was considered to be the best way to overcome this disease. Now, consumption, tuberculosis, is not the problem for us that it used to be back then. Even if you get tuberculosis, we have treatments for that. You can go to the doctor, get some medicine, and help you fight it off. They didn't have that back then. Um, and so it took months and months and months, possibly years, to fight this thing off. It was an absolutely debilitating disease. It was called consumption because it destroyed your appetite and you gradually just got thinner and thinner and thinner until it just killed you off. It was a absolutely devastating thing. And now imagine for a minute, and we'll have some commonality here right now as well. Imagine the economic impact of this disease. If you're going to end up sitting in a hospital for, you know, anywhere up to, in you know, going past a year, what happens to your livelihood during that? How do you afford that? It's incredibly expensive to go to the hospital and get that kind of treatment. And so the only people who could really afford to be treated for this were people who were extremely wealthy. You could go to state-run institutions, but you weren't going to get the same kind of quality care that you got at those very expensive private institutions. Again, all of us are like, oh, we, we, we understand these problems, especially in light of our current circumstances. So the very beginning of the play has us, Edmund is sick. And for like half the play, we don't want to face the fact that he probably has consumption. Now, <clears throat> this causes a great deal of the anxiety in the first part of the play. Once Edmund, once his diagnosis is confirmed, everything spirals out of control. Now, our the Tyrone family is an amazing cut of family dysfunction. The stuff that goes wrong with the Tyrone family, if you've lived with any type of dysfunctional family, you're going to notice the ways that they abuse each other. The, the patterns of abuse are incredibly universal so that it's hyper-realistic and 
honestly, I don't like to use the word trigger very often, but it can be triggering for people who have been in families that were abusive. So one of the first things that we see is that the family begins to use Tyra, um, begins to use Edmund's possibility of consumption to fall back into bad habits. Edmund is sick. And so every member of the family begins to drink. There's whiskey everywhere, right? I mean, you literally could go into the father's bedroom, look underneath his pillow. There's probably a half drunk bottle of whiskey in there, right? So everyone is beginning to drink, even though they know they shouldn't. They know they can't handle their drink, but they're all like, look, this is a bad time. We're all in a bad way. I think I can drink a little bit. That's one of the first issues that you run into. <clears throat> Edmund's sickness is an excuse for every single member of this family to fall back into their worser selves. Now, it's worse for Edmund because Edmund has been told to cut the red eye. It's one of my favorite. I used to do a reading quiz on that. What do they refer to? What are some of the nicknames they refer to? The whiskey? The red eye is what Jamie calls it. Edmund's not supposed to be drinking right now, and yet he keeps drinking because he's he's trying to deal with the reality of this thing that's haunting him. Now, my favorite part of this play, and there's so much, there's so much interesting stuff to kind of come out. The very beginning of the play has hints that the mother has started doing something as well. Now, you guys have all finished watching the play. Of course, her drug of choice is not drink, although she does drink as well. She's addicted to morphine. She's addicted to morphine. Now, she disappears upstairs. This pattern is established. She's using Edmund's sickness as a justification to begin using morphine again. I can't handle this. I need my medicine. I need this thing to help me cope with my son's sickness. This family has found an excuse to go back into the horrible things that have destroyed them in the past. And meanwhile, Edmund is sitting here sick with tuberculosis. And he's the one who's having to try to keep the family together. How horrific a role that Edmund has to do that. Now, in recent years, I've gotten very interested in the psychology of narcissistic personality disorder and the weird ways that that expresses itself. This is a family almost made completely of narcissists. They are, they're not necessarily so concerned with Edmund's well-being. They're concerned with their own. And they're hypersensitive to the need <clears throat> that they need to protect their well-being. So for Jamie, his older brother, and for the mom, that translates to drug use. I need to drink to protect myself from Edmund's sickness. I need to start shooting morphine again in order to protect myself from the emotional impact of Edmund's sickness. For the father, he starts drinking as well. But for the father, it actually expresses itself in a different way. The father begins to be miserly. Money is the thing that helps him feel protected. That sense that he is, you know, protecting himself financially. And so for Tyrone, the sickness of Edmund means that he needs to guard his money. He does not want to send Edmund to an expensive sanatorium. He does not want to send Edmund to a good doctor. He wants to get as much money out of this situation as he can. Now, these coping mechanisms are actually the thing that causes the disintegration of this family. This is the thing that starts to really spiral everything out of control. Who is the person who has the right to be emotionally distressed right now? Maybe that's not the most proper way of thinking about this. Who is the person who has, well, who is most justified in harboring a, you know, disturbed kind of psychiatric sentiment? It's Edmund. Edmund is sick. Edmund is facing his own mortality. And yet he's in competition with the rest of his family for the right to feel that psychiatric disturbance. 
Do we do this in our everyday lives? Do we take other people's pain and suffering as an excuse to kind of self-obsess ourselves? Rather than cover this entire play in one video, I thought it might be kind of a cool idea to break it up into several. And this will let us sort of walk into the novel in the next two weeks so that we'll have some time to kind of digest this play. For today, I want you to look back on your own life. And I want you to think very carefully, when have you used the suffering of another person to put forward your own selfish needs? I'll go first. And I have to kind of think about this. Maybe not right now. I don't want to live stream my own Mr. Bailey confessions. But I will participate in the discussion forum with you. This does not make you a bad person. This makes you human. We use the suffering of others to be selfish ourselves. And it's, this is what literature should do. It should help us connect with these sides of ourselves that we might not necessarily be so prepared to confront. Now, I'm going to end this here. This was live streamed, which is kind of cool. Uh, I'll post the discussion, and uh, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Cool beans. Hey, AJ. Comment on my videos. It'll be very happy. This is AJ Styles, by the way, the greatest wrestler who ever lived. Yeah. Go away, David. <clears throat> oh, God, I thought I ended it and I snorted. <laughs>